Hi and welcome back again to my YouTube channel. Uh, as I alluded to in the video I've just completed about uh, Frank Hurley, I want to now speak about another Australian photographer who was uh, an amazing photographer and cinematographer uh, who was a little bit younger I think than Frank Hurley was but they were operating in the same places at, sometimes during the wartime. But uh, Ronald Monroe, Ronald K Monroe um, was a photographer and um, I first came across him, Australian photographer, and I came across his work when one day my wife and I were in a, a second hand shop or an antique shop one day and, and she came across this book that was in there <coughs> and um, it was called Australian Nature Stories by Ronald K Monroe and because as you're probably aware I'm keen on wildlife photography and books about birds and animals and photography like that, that type of genre, um, she, my wife actually bought it for me. Usually I'm the one buying books and she's telling me off, but she said, oh, you'd, you'd like this, or I think she might have bought it when I wasn't looking or something, I don't know. Anyway, I got the book and I got it home and it's the only book that Ron Monroe ever made and it was actually published after his death. He quite died quite young, um, uh, just after the end of the Second World War, I think it was. And... Um, here it is. It's called Australian Nature Stories. Now I've written about this. There's a bit of a flapping coming off there. I've written about this on my um, blog before, and I'll put a link underneath to what I've written about before. And there are some extracts from this book on my blog, so you better link and look that up. But um, this book was. Um, it's got a forward by um, Charles Barrett, but I also read from the um, the. Uh, introduction to this inside the, the, the front cover by a man called Crosby Morrison, editor of Wild Life. There you go. So here's a little bit about Ron Monroe and we'll try and unpack this story a little bit to just whet your appetite about um, this this largely unsung photographer. His family know all about what he did and the people in the War Memorial and people who he worked with and uh, friends and family, particularly in the town that he came from, they would know a lot about him. But uh, the general public, I don't think, knows too much about Ron Monroe. Lieutenant Ronald Keith Monroe, whose untimely death has left us only this one book, was no ordinary naturalist. He combined qualities and experience which many others might envy with good cause. The fresh outlook of youth, which never lost its keenness, and insatiable, insatiable curiosity, coupled with keen powers of, of observation, a national bent for photography, developed by first-class training and that knowledge of the world and of affairs and of what people like that comes with years of newspaper work. He was a newspaper photojournalist. <coughs> Born in Victoria, he began his career in Melbourne as a news photographer. Transferred to Perth, where he gained further experience and returned to Melbourne as staff photographer of the Sun, the Herald and Wildlife. His hobby of bird photography developed qualities of patience and instant action which made this ph the photography of men and events by comparison a simple business to him. <coughs> I often used to say as a former wedding photographer you could photograph a wedding you could photograph anything so he had lots of experience in photographing people and that means you can do other stuff as well and he obviously could. Where was I up to? But it was natural that when there was a natural history assignment on the list, <coughs> Ron Monroe got it. It was on one of these assignments to photograph a breeding colony of ibis in the lagoons near the Murray that he took what is probably the most famous bird series, that of the rare royal spoonbill, royal spoonbill which you will see in this book. Very early in the war, he enlisted and saw active service in North Africa. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and North Africa, thereabouts, before being transferred to the military history section as official war photographer. It was a pioneer, it was as a pioneer of night photography of Australian birds by flashlight that his fame spread most widely. The magnificent study of the Boo Book Owl, bringing home a honey eater to the two babes, is known all over the world. It is undoubtedly his best single picture and still stands as one of the world's best bird flashlights. Of course, people have gone way past what these early pioneers of, of uh, nature photography were doing. With all the latest gear, they can do just about anything. But as the reader will quickly discern, Ronald Munro 
Monroe was much more than a good photographer. He had the rare gift of for weaving fact and fantasy into a simple story without sacrifices of scientific accuracy. His stories as told here might well be fairy tales to hold children from play and old men from the chimney corner, yet the most pernickety scientist would not, could not discover in them a single misstatement or distortion of fact. This one book will delight, I feel sure, generations of Australians, but it does more. It stands as a memorial to one of Australia's most promising younger naturalists and photographers. Inside the um, front cover here, there is a dedication, I think. I'll just read that out to you in a minute. <clears throat> I can find it. To all good mothers, this is written by Ron Monroe. This book is dedicated first to the memory of my own mother, who with loving care and guidance fostered in me an appreciation of the beauty and goodness in nature. Then to the mother of my son, Robin, who shares with me the pleasure of leading him along nature's pathways to happiness. And so to all other mothers, feathered, furred and human, whose lives are dedicated to their families with the loving tenderness that only mothers know. The, national, the natural inheritance from Mother Earth, who bounteously cradles her children in her eternal bosom. There you go. It's interesting, he mentions in there his son Robin. When I wrote about this book and my finding this book on my blog, Robin actually got in touch with me and said, I'm glad you like my dad's book. And I've since had some correspondence and, and a couple of phone calls with Robin. And he lives in another state to South Australia. And um, he actually sent me, a, at the time of his death, Ron had been writing his memoirs and, and uh, his son has extensive diaries. And these memoirs are quite incredible. I got... Um, the first book of, of his memoirs. I've got them on PDF form. But uh, I might read a little bit from one of that. And But I, the, I found the other day a um, uh, an extract from... What's that thing they call on uh, when you can look into all the old newspapers on the uh, Trove, is it? I think it is. Trove is the all the newspaper archives. This is something that um, was from one of the Trove articles I found in one of the old newspapers and where he wrote himself about... Um, he, he never wanted to go to the war in the first place. Uh, he was a pacifist. But anyway, he found his way in and became a famous war photographer and uh, cinematographer. And a lot of his archives are, are in the National Library and particularly um, aerial footage of, of, of planes in combat, I think. Uh, I think Robin told me. I haven't looked at those yet. But here's a little extract from just something of what... Uh, and he was a, one of what they call the Rats of Tobruk. He was in Tobruk. And... Uh, Here's a little extract from something that he wrote when he was over there in the Middle East and dreaming of being back home. And I'll just read this from you, a little bit to you, to give an insight into this man, Ron Monroe. Every soldier knows the nostalgia, I'm reading off my screen here. Every soldier knows the nostalgia he feels after months abroad when he thinks of his own country. Ronald K. Monroe of the Herald Staff, who wrote this story from Tobruk, tells how this feeling affects him. In Tobruk, in the midst of sand, of its sand, this is from Ron himself, I think. In the midst of its sand in Tobruk, desolation and monotony, and monotony. I have enjoyed the beauties of Australia here in the desert, with no green thing, no song of birds or anything of home to break the monotony. I find that I live in thought, halfway half the world away. This morning, I am sure, only my body was here. My innermost self was visiting many a ferny creek and grassy flat in my homeland. But my complete person was hurriedly reassembled by the air raid signal and the sound of ak, -ak fire. It is most, or anti-aircraft fire, I would say. It is most peaceful here today. There are the usual air raids and some spasmodic shelling but the elements are at peace. As I look out over the harbour, it is placid, ruffled only by small craft that seem to tickle its slumbering surface. A pair of tiny blue kingfishers dart in and out of its clear water, while swallows skim its surface in their effortless flight. My thoughts, too, were singing swallows and homeward they, they sped. I tell you, I tell you of a very few of the six places I visited and you will also know them. 
you who also know them will realise how truly I was back home this October day. I was a boy, back under the almond trees in our old orchard in Gippsland. The heavy scent from their clustering blossoms filled the air, as did also the humming of bees working among them. I held a branch close and smelled deeply, then watched the bees with pollen-laden legs crawl with pollen-laden legs crawl from centre to centre in search of nectar. I caught one by holding its wings, together with finger, finger and thumb, and laughed as it vainly tried to sting me. When I let it go, its angry attack drove me in hurried flight down the path. Down to the creek I went to catch frogs, while petals of the clary plum blossoms floated past in the curling stream, like spangles in a bride's train. Flat beetles darted on the surface in the shallows, then died below without a ripple. Big brown, dra big brown dragon fries, horse stingers in those days, that's what we called them when I was a kid, uh, darted up and down in search of mosquitoes. I passed over the frog hunt for a more exciting chase after partalotes. Witty Joes, he's got in bracket here, that they were called. They had their nesting burrows along the banks. I watched them as they sat on roots, just a foot from my face. They seemed to scrutinise me carefully. All that moved on me was my eyeballs, which followed every movement and w with wild excitement. When they entered their nesting tunnels, I placed my hand over the entrance. In the fraction of a se second, I lifted it to peep inside. Out they flew to freedom. Much older, I stood at midday in the sheep lands of New South Wales. I looked across the stretching plains, covered with multi-coloured flowers. Dry air was not... Was, the air was hot but very sweet. The sheep sought the shades of knobby gum trees while galahs and cockatoos preened themselves in the green above. Grass parrots shrilled about in noisy, colourful flocks. Along the dusty track stood the sheds. The smell of fresh wool was heavy on the air and crows flew off on untidy wing as I passed. Horses slumped and switched tails beneath a dead tree at the edge of the lagoon. Edge of the lagoon on which sleeping drow, I'm not sure what that is, blackened the surface with their numerous bodies. Sleeping fowl, wild fowl, I think that is. It's a typo. I might finish there, but it just goes on and on. He was obviously a brilliant writer and a very descriptive writer, but he used to capture things uh, on his um, camera. Uh, he would visualise things and then capture them and, and reproduce them with his camera. So that's a little bit from him, from this diary that, that his son Robin sent to me. I'll just read a little bit what happened when the war broke out and uh, where he was and what his thoughts were, his immediate thoughts. I won't go too far into it because it is a personal account. And uh, I'll just read from, from this. I only read a couple of paragraphs. This article explains how I joined the AIF, Australian Infantry Forces, as a private. And now I'll tell why. War was declared on the day I was starting on my annual leave. I had made great preparations, having bought a new trailer, fully equipped with all camping gear and mod cons. With my two pals, Norm Brown and Jack Kenny, plus my Irish wolfhound called Thunder, we were all having a happy time at Snake Valley, where we were starting the following day on a deer hunt. We were enjoying Billy tea and toast when the news came over my car radio. Hitler, I exploded. He might have quit quiet for another three weeks. We drank our tea. Thunder got most of the toast. That's the dog. I felt I wanted to rush back to Melbourne and be in the excitement, yet I didn't want to join up. I hate strife of any kind. I'm an out-and-out -out pacifist. I dislike community life. I dislike community life and am a real individualist. Still, I felt I should rush back and join up with the first batch and be in the swim. I won't read on. It's a fascinating story and I'm hopeful that one day Robin and his family or someone else will put all this into print in a proper book. But um, he was a truly remarkable man. This is just to open up and show you some of the um, insides of this book. It's all in a monotone. Uh, the Cuckoo in the Nest and all these stories are written uh, as if the, the people are really, you know, the, the birds and animals are like real people. There's that horror, I'll just read, this is the cuckoo in the nest, I'll just read the start. 
There's that horrid Mrs. Cuckoo in the next tree, dear. Do go and chase her away, said Mrs. Honey Eater to her husband, as she sat on her tiny nest, swinging high among the leaves. She had just laid her second egg, and was resting quietly with her mate sitting beside her, chirping encouragement. You never mind her, my love. Just rest and leave her to me, said he proudly, and straightway set off in hot pursuit of the designing Mrs. Pallid Cuckoo. He chased her well away, then gathered some manna from a nearby tree and returned with it to his wife to show his appreciation of her good work. All of these stories are written in that tome as if the uh, birds and animals are real people. And uh, I've put some extracts of some of that on my blog. You'll have the links below. So there you go. We've had a look at um, today. We've had a look at Frank um, Hurley. And now we're having a look at Ronald Monroe. Two um, really, in my eyes, brilliant Australian photographers. Both two very different types of people. But both with the poet's way of looking at things and the photographer's ability to compose and to appreciate nature and everything they saw around them and uh, truly we were blessed to have such people around and of course there are lots of modern day photographers and people who do similar things but these are just two of my favorites and uh, Ron Monroe in particular uh, is a, a favorite of mine so thanks for watching again and uh, and like if you like subscribe if you wish and uh, I'll see you next time